Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Kabir Considers. In this video, I'm going to react to the insane engineering of the SR-71 Blackbird. Now this has to be one of my favourite planes of all time. That's including both military and uh, civilian, like passenger planes. The aesthetics of it, the speed of it, the look, everything is just like the story behind it. Apparently the US government had to create like um, shell companies to get the titanium out of uh, the Soviet Union or something like that. Just absolutely incredible. And I can't wait to actually learn about how it was made, how it was developed. Cause I think they designed this thing in like the fifties or the sixties. So yeah, this should be a fun video for me to watch. So let's do it. It's hard to explain the engineering marvel that is the SR-71 Blackbird. Look at a that long range there. plane capable of flying 26 kilometers above the surface of the planet. Wow. So high that the pilots could see the curvature of the planet and the inky black of space from their cockpits. It flew so fast that the engineers had to develop entirely new materials and designs to mitigate and dissipate the heat generated from aerodynamic friction. It's so Entirely unique it. engines were needed to function from zero all the way up to Mach 3.2 dealing with the myriad of problems like cooling, fuel efficiency, and supersonic shockwaves interfering with airflow. A plane so advanced that when it detected a surface-to-air missile, its response was simply to change course and speed up. Even though the missiles had a higher top speed, they couldn't achieve the range and high altitude maneuverability the Blackbird could. This allowed the SR-71 to run hundreds of missions through Vietnam, North Korea and Iraq without ever losing an aircraft to enemy fire, Amazing. despite multiple attempts. The entire plane was built around the propulsion system, which alone was a miracle of engineering design. For one, no turbine driven jet engine can operate with supersonic flow at its inlet. Yet, this plane was powered by the Pratt & Whitney J58 turbojet engine. But get this, off the shelf, these engines could only provide 17.6% of the thrust required for Mach 3.2 flights. So how did they a achieve speed them? which the SR-71 could cruise at for extended periods of time. How on earth did it manage that? In order to achieve those kinds of speeds, a ramjet is typically needed. A ramjet, as you can probably guess from the name, relies on ram pressure to operate. Ram pressure is simply the pressure that occurs as a plane rams itself through the air. Right. So, as the engine moves through the sky, it funnels this high pressure air inside. Before entering the combustion chamber, the supersonic airflow must be first slowed down. This basically acts like the compressor stage of a normal jet engine, elevating the air pressure before it enters the combustion chamber. Once the air enters the combustion chamber, it is mixed with fuel and ignited. It expands and accelerates once again out of the exit nozzle. It's incredible how they did all of this science back in the 60s before they had like CAD and you know, supercomputers and stuff like that. It just makes it even more impressive. With no moving parts, this type of engine is capable of flying at speeds far greater than a typical turbine driven engine. I see. But it cannot start from zero. It needs forward movement in right. order to achieve the correct compression of Some air momentum. in the combustion chamber. So they are either dropped from a conventional plane, have a secondary propulsion system, or are a hybrid of a conventional jet engine and a ramjet, which is precisely what the SR-71 used. The turbojet J58 engine of the SR-71 is nestled inside the nacelle here. In front and around the J58 is a complicated system of airflow management. These control mechanisms allow the propulsion system to transition from a primarily turbojet engine to a ramjet engine in mid-flight. First, the inlet spike. It is capable of moving forward and back by 0.66 meters. This adjusts the inlet and throat area, which controls the airflow entering the engine. It also keeps the position of the normal shockwave at its ideal position between the inlet throat and the compressor. This is the most efficient position for the shockwave, as it minimizes the energy lost. It's amazing innovation, honestly. <laughs> My mind's blown. Due to drag, as air flows over the shockwave, the inlet spike stays in the forward position until Mach 1.6, 
After this point, it begins to move backwards by 41 mm for every 0.1 increase in Mach number, keeping the shockwave in its ideal position. The inlet spike contains perforations which connect to the outside of the nacelle through ducts. Initially, the airflow will come from the outside in to provide additional airflow to the turbojet engines. But once the plane hits about Mach 0.5, this airflow reverses. As the plane speeds up, the inlet spike develops a significant boundary layer of air. A boundary layer is a layer of very slow moving air that clings to the surface of objects. By bleeding this layer of slow moving air off the inlet spike, it frees up a greater area of the inlet area right. for high energy, fast moving air and thus improves efficiency. Right. Around the engine, there is a bypass area which takes air from the inlet and bypasses it around the J58 engine. This air was used to cool the J58, which again improved engine efficiency and allowed the plane to fly faster. After the air passes the engine, it rejoins the airflow just after the engine afterburner, adding additional thrust as more oxygen becomes available for combustion and increases the pressure through the ejector nozzle. Whenever I've seen planes like this, or just any kind of high-tech thing designed, it's always been on like computers and stuff. How would they design this? Would, it, would they have to like draw it? You know, like using rulers and stuff? Like, like how, because in this era, I can't even, because I wasn't born in the 50s or the 60s, how did they design stuff like this back then? Air got into this bypass area in a number of ways. There was a shock trap, otherwise known as the cowl bleed, located here, which again helped minimize boundary layer growth. There were suck-in doors located here, which only opened from Mach 0 to Mach 0.5 to add additional air to the bypass for engine cooling. Air from the aft bypass doors located just before the J58 engine also fed into the bypass. These together with the forward bypass doors, which vented to the atmosphere, were used to control the pressure level in the inlet at the optimum wow. level. If it was getting too high, a pressure sensor would trigger the forward bypass doors to open, allowing more air to exit That's really clever. Inlet, while the aft bypass doors were controlled by the pilot. These doors played a critical role in maintaining the position of the normal shock wave. If this was mismanaged, the engine would lose control of the normal shock wave and may even spit it out of the intake, resulting in a sudden power loss called an unstart which would cause the plane to violently yaw in the direction of the faulty engine. If this happened, the forward bypass doors would open fully and the spike would move to the forward position okay. to reduce back pressure and, it would level and get the, the shockwave out. back into its normal position. Besides this bypass area that took air from the inlet and dumped it into the ejector, there were also six bypass ducts that took air from the compressor and dumped it directly into the afterburner. These ducts were the primary mechanism oh, that transformed that engine. the engine from a turbojet into a ramjet. Afterburners are great. They significantly add to thrust without needing a whole lot of additional weight. But they use a lot they of basically fuel. just inject fuel into the exhaust of the jet engine and ignite it with whatever oxygen is left to provide additional expansion and therefore thrust. But, but afterburners aren't fuel efficient, aren't they? They are really inefficient. However, as the speed increases, they are the only feasible way to generate thrust and they do gain efficiency thanks to the forward motion providing the compression of air needed to run them, instead of the turbine needing to be powered to turn the compressor stage. The crazy thing about the SR71 is that the engineers could have eked out more thrust from this engine to increase the top speed even more. Ramjets can go up to Mach 5. So wow. why did they stop at 3.2? And Mach 5 is about 5,000 miles an hour, because each Mach is about, what, 750, 800, I think? Would they have run out of fuel? Fuel efficiency in terms of cost doesn't mean a whole lot to a military plane like this. The military doesn't care about cost, but the more fuel you carry, the heavier and bigger the plane gets, mm -hmm. increasing the fuel it uses. There is a break-even point and the plane's range will be limited but the engineers did manage to fill the plane up with an astounding amount of fuel with some clever engineering. 
The plane was strictly a surveillance plane, so no internal volume was used for weapons, freeing up space for fuel. You have probably heard that the SR-71 leaks fuel on the runway Does because it? there were gaps in the fuselage, but that's a simple fact that ignores much of the engineering that caused it. The but that's dangerous, no? Because if, if, if it was to ignite... <laughs> SR-71 used something called a total wet wing fuel tank system, which meant that the fuel was not contained within a separate fuel bladder. This was a weight saving measure. Separate metal fuel tanks would add too much More weight, weight. Yeah. and lighter plastic ones would melt from the intense heat, heat generated yeah, yeah. from the aerodynamic friction. So the fuel was contained by the skin of the plane itself. That's the engineers crazy. applied sealant to every gap the fuel could possibly come out of, but because the titanium skin of the plane expanded and contracted with every flight, Gaps it gradually been. deteriorated uh. over time, allowing the fuel to leak out. Because of this, the SR-71 had to regularly go into maintenance and have sealant reapplied, but it usually came back still leaking, just not quite as much. The number of man hours required to reduce it to zero was simply too great to fit it between flights. So they just had an allowable fuel leak limit, which looked like this. 10 drops per minute. <laughs> Damn. I love how they've, they've calculated it per drop. This plane, like a rocket, was mostly fuel. Its dry weight, depending on sensor payload, was between 25 and 27 tons. Its wet weight was between 61 Damn. and 63 tons, making it, by weight, 59% fuel to feed those hungry engines. Even then, without the ability to refuel in the air, this plane would have had terrible range for what was supposed to be a long range spy plane. No. Range varied greatly. For example, the engines became significantly less efficient when the outside temperature was higher. A fully loaded SR-71 could expect to burn nearly 13 metric tons of fuel accelerating from Mach 1.25 at 30,000 feet to Mach 3 at 70,000 feet. 13 tons of fuel. God, I'm trying to imagine that because obviously when you fill up your car, you're putting like, I don't know, 50 liters in, 100 liters, you know, or whatever it is, like tons of fuel. If the outside temperature was 10 degrees Celsius above standard, that is 36% of its fuel capacity. If it was 10 degrees below standard, the fuel burn nearly halved to 7.2 tons. And of course, the range was severely affected by their speed and use of the afterburner. But on average, the SR-71 had a range of about 5,200 kilometers, about enough for a one-way trip from New York to London not terribly useful. Mm. The US was not going to be landing at their target to hand over a top secret plane to the enemy. No way. However, with aerial refueling, mm. the plane could stay in the air more or less indefinitely, provided there was no mechanical issues. Like massive leakage. Really, the range was entirely determined by the pilots. The longest operational sortie occurred in 1987, when the US flew the SR-71 from Okinawa to observe developments in the Iran-Iraq war. This mission lasted 11.2 hours and likely required at least five aerial refuelings along the way. So if it wasn't the fuel or engines that limited the SR-71's top speed, what did? At Mach 3.2, the nose of the SR- Does anybody know what the longest duration is that a pilot has stayed, you know, in, in the air? I can't imagine it's more than a day. About 24 hours because you know you, there's only so many cereal bars that you can eat you need some proper food and sleep right 71 reached 300 degrees celsius while the engine nacelles could reach 306 at the front and 649 at the back this is what truly limited the top speed of the sr-71 without careful material selection and design the plane would simply overheat Melt. and fail. Yeah. Even the fuel needed to be specially formulated to get around these overheating issues. It was a specially formulated fuel called JP7, which has very low volatility and a high flash point. This was partially needed because the fuel leaked on the runway, 
and they needed a fuel that wouldn't ignite or right. easily so evaporate and make it. the ground crew ill. Clever. But mostly, they needed a fuel that wouldn't vaporize in the tanks and cause fuel feed and pressurization problems. The JP-7 fuel was so stable that it actually doubled as a coolant for the entire plane. The fuel was pumped around the airframe to cool critical components like the engine oil, hydraulic systems, and control electronics. When the fuel got too hot, it was simply sent to the engines for combustion. The fuel was so stable that the plane actually needed to carry shots of triethyl boring, a fuel that spontaneously ignites in the presence of oxygen, to start the combustion cycle and after burners. The plane usually only carried about 16 shots of this, so the pilots needed to manage them carefully, particularly when slowing down for refueling and managing unstarts. One huge question I had about the SR-71 was why it was painted black. Airliners are all white to reflect heat and prevent yeah. the plane from overheating. If That's that applies question. to an airliner, why not the SR-71? The SR-71's predecessors were unpainted, which saved weight and- Let me guess, is it, to, is it some special kind of coat that, you know, throws off radar? or you know, it's, it's, gotta, it's gotta be something like that. The areas exposed to highest temperatures were painted black. Why was this? Surely black would absorb more heat. The Concorde was once painted blue for a Pepsi ad campaign and had to lower its speed as it absorbed too much heat from the sun. However, the Concorde did not fly nearly as high or as fast as the SR-71. Amazing And plane. as the SR-71 rose, the energy it absorbed from the sun dwindled in comparison to the heat it gained from aerodynamic friction. For this, we have to refer to something called Kirchhoff's Rule of Radiation, which tells us that a good heat absorber, like a black object, is also an equally effective heat emitter. So, the black paint helped the SR-71 radiate heat away from the plane, as it allowed the plane to radiate more heat than it gained from the radiation from the sun. I see. These efforts helped to keep the plane cool, but the structure of the plane still needed to be incredibly heat stable. Mm. Aluminium is typically the material aircraft engineers turn to. It was used for the Concorde, but as we saw, it too had its speed limited by heat to a much lower Mach 2. And aluminium isn't, it's not a really tough metal. It's, it's really malleable, like, so I imagine that the, the durability of, you know, whatever components are made of aluminium isn't very good. Aluminium is cheap, has a great strength to weight ratio, and That's is it. easily machinable. Titanium, the material that made up 93% of the SR-71, is only one of these properties. Its strength to weight ratio, otherwise known as specific strength, is fantastic. But titanium is incredibly expensive, despite it being the seventh most common metal in Earth's crust. Why is it so the refinement process is incredibly long and requires expensive consumables. It's also not easily machinable, as it readily reacts with air when welding or forging, becoming brittle. For these reasons, titanium is rarely used in structural parts in aviation. However, the real benefit of titanium is its ability to resist heat. Yes. The reasons for this are complex that we will explore in depth in future. However, the gist is that titanium alloys have incredibly strong bonding within its crystal lattice that resists heat from breaking them apart. Oh. Titanium alloys can resist temperatures up to 600 degrees Celsius before their atoms begin to diffuse and slide over each other significantly allowing it to retain much of its strength even at 300 degrees. Heat. It has also very low thermal expansion, so that expansion and contraction we mentioned earlier is minimized, reducing the thermal stresses in the aircraft. But titanium has its limits, and for the SR-71, this was about 3.2 Mach. Today, engineers have made huge strides in material science. The SR-71 used heat-resistant composite material. Yeah, someone mentioned that there's an SR-72 in the works. I need to see some, I wanna see some footage of it. If anybody knows of any actual footage of the plane, please send it to me on Instagram or via email, please. Materials as radar absorbing wedges between the structural frame located in these locations. The manufacturing techniques needed to make composite materials as load-bearing structures did not yet exist, 
but that has changed. The SR-71 successor, the SR-72, which is now in development, will take advantage of new, high-performance composites which will allow it to reach speeds up to Mach 6. Woo. Many of its engine components will likely be 3D printed titanium with cooling ducts printed right into the part. Its range also won't be determined by pilots as it will be an autonomous drone. The insane engineering that makes planes like this possible fascinates me and I recently watched an excellent documentary on CuriosityStream that details the build process for the world's largest airliner the A380, chronicling the massive sheet metal cutting machines that cut the aluminium skin, the vacuum moulds that form it, and the biggest oven in Britain that locks the shape in place. This is just one step in the process, and the documentary is nearly an hour long. This is just one of thousands- An absolutely magnificent plane. Honestly, it's, uh, doesn't it, is it just me or does it not look exactly like the plane from uh, X-Men? Like, I think it's called the X-Wing or something like that, but it looks just like it. I would love to see one in person. There's gotta be one at a museum. Maybe, probably not in the UK, probably in the US somewhere. I wanna get up close to it. Just see, cause a lot of people have said it's a lot bigger than it appears in pictures or videos, so. Yeah, it's definitely easily one of my favorite planes of all time. Thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you in the next one.